What's up, Facebook world? It's Ryan Banta again. Um, trying to play a little bit of catch up with my top five suggestions and ideas for different uh, training in the world of sport, uh, more specifically to the sport of track and field and to sprinting. Um, last couple days, I posted in a number of different groups on Facebook, uh, different ideas that they wanted me to do for my weekly top fives and different discussions about, you know, what we can do for training and and one of the groups that was the most uh, prolific with their questions and ideas was a USATF master's group for how to train sprinters correctly and how to uh, get people where they need to go uh, as they reach a little bit older uh, ages. And I kind of felt inspired today because I just got done mowing the lawn. And I remember back in the day how much easier it used to be to, to do some of the daily physical activities that uh, I used to do so often, let alone be someone who's uh, training for, uh, you know, the world of speed and, and uh, being a master's athlete through USATF or through the International uh, Federation. Uh, I've been blessed to kind of talk with and share with uh, Lion Martinez, who is a world champion in the 100 meter dash. And uh, he was able to run some really cool times and, and really do some incredible things. So I have a little bit of an understanding of what that is from a coaching perspective, besides only, you know, my own experiences as uh, being a frustrated sprinter who was often hurt while I was younger, let alone now reaching the ripe old age of 40 coming up in July. So one of the questions that was asked was about acceleration. You know, and, and that we'll start with that one. With acceleration in all athletes, people can accelerate a lot. That's one of the things that you can train and you can improve. And one of the one of the few skill sets that you can really, really make a big difference in uh, as an athlete, as uh, of any age. And one of the things I always think of is, you know, first and foremost, you want to start with a, a nice steady progression. So if you're an athlete that's first taking up, you know, master's level track, you know, probably jumping in the blocks or pushing a prowler or doing a sled drive or a sled drag or something like that probably isn't the smartest thing. So when we look at progressions, I like to use Gary Winkler's kind of acceleration play where they'll start out with a, a walk-in start. Then they'll start in with a lean and fall start. The next thing they'll do is they'll do a two-point start, then a three-point start. Then once you feel comfortable with all those positions, then you probably could go ahead and get into the blocks. However, I wouldn't think that that's something you want to do in one session. You know, maybe you can split that up over a course of a couple of days or things like that. The other thing is as a master's athlete, and because I believe acceleration is a skill and it's something that can be worked on quite frequently, that should be a major part of your program as an athlete because it is something that you can work on and you can continue to do. And there's so many different ways um, that you can accelerate. And then once you feel comfortable with that progression of a walk in, a fall and, and take off, a two point, a three point, and then a block start, then I think you can get into doing some sled drives and some sled pools and things like that. But again, you have to be very careful with overload, you know, because, you know, your back is not what it once was and, you know, certain things. So you got to ask yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze? So for us, I like to use like a six-week progression. And so what ends up happening is you're doing something for six weeks. And then at the end of the six weeks, we start to taper off and then go, which leads me to another thing. When we're talking about training uh, a master's athlete, there needs to be more recovery within your plan. You can't run some long Matt Viev training model where you're just basically increasing volume all the time. That's just not realistic and not something that you can do. Um, it's more important, I would think, to start off small and then work your way up into larger numbers, but then still require or give yourself that break and that recovery, not only throughout your training sessions day to day, but week to week, month to month, and then throughout the weeks. So you should have multiple peaks going on throughout your training plan all the time with built-in days of recovery between hard days more than you would when you were young. You know, um, we talk about an athlete, Greg Rutherford, who's not a master's lap athlete by any means, but he might train hard only twice a week. That's it. And if you're a master's athlete and you're just starting to do this, you're starting to train, you know, you need to make sure this is something that you can sustain, that it fits within your lifestyle. Because if you're a master's athlete, you've probably got a job, you've got a career, you've got family, you might have kids. So whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that you've built in 
a flexible enough plan that you can get it done, that you feel good about it, and that you're not destroyed for seven days and afraid to come back to training. Training acceleration allows you to do that. You can do that on a regular basis. It's a skill, and it sets up everything else that you're going to do, whether you're a jumper, a pole vaulter, a sprinter, a hurdler. All of us have to accelerate. So that's something you work on all the time, and it doesn't take the, the load or the damage that some other things do. All right, moving into another topic. I was asked a question about how, as Masters athletes, do we attack the issue of improving stride length? Well, I think it's more about maybe not even improving stride length, but maybe trying to do your best to maintain stride length. You know, one of the things that we notice when people get a lot older is their strides as they walk go from like a normal stride to kind of a small walk to a shuffle to now we're in a cart. You know, and so, you know, one of the things that I used to joke about with my uh, old coach and mentor, Steve Warren, is like big steps, big steps, big steps. Okay. Well, obviously, that's not going to help us be a USATF athlete, but might be something we want to think about as we get older. But what I think is best for stride length are low level, low impact plyometrics. You know, it might be fun to go hop over hurdles and feel like you're 18 all over again. But that's definitely not realistic and something that will not be able to be maintained by a master's athlete. So instead, I think low amplitude endurance bounding and the progression there should be very simple. It should be in place jumps first, first for time, not even context. So, hey, we're going to we're going to pogo hop for 30 seconds. Now we're going to do slalom skis for 30 seconds. We're going to go back and forth. Maybe we do a tuck jump you know, for, for 30 seconds, whatever it may be. And those jumps are in place. Then from there, you start to do double leg bounding to a distance. And again, small doses are always better. Make sure that you don't overreach and you destroy your week and feel like you don't want to train anymore because that's, that's not the goal. The goal is to do something that's sustainable for the rest of your life and be competitive for as long as you can be. So I always think that, you know, you start off with whatever, when you start to add a little bit of movement into those double leg jumps, they should start off with just 20 yards or 20 meters for each jump there and back. And then as you feel comfortable with that and you kind of know what your body's going to do and how your body's going to respond to it, then you can start to add up some distance. But I would never go out as far as 50 yards or anything crazy like that. I would always keep it within, you know, a 40-yard distance at maximum, you know, with the different types of jumps. Then once you're comfortable with your double leg bounding, then you move into more of the traditional single leg lefts and rights, rights and lefts, left, left, right, 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 left, those type of jumps. But again, that can only happen once you feel comfortable with some of the other jumps. Another thing that's great is to do stadium runs. And I know that people are like, well, wait a second, stadium r- runs reduce your stride length. Yeah, but what, what it does help you do is if you're doing the upright version of stadium runs where you're touching each step with one foot, it forces you to run upright and help, and help protect that posture, that vertical posture that you want when you're running. And so that's something that you could add into your repertoire after you get comfortable with a certain number of contacts with, with low amplitude plyometrics. Um, and so that's something that I think could be very, very beneficial. Um, and again, not blow you up. Now, as we've been talking here, you understand that everything I'm giving you is a caveat of going small, experimenting, seeing how you respond, and then going ahead and adding. When push comes to shove, the best option you can have is always less is more. Because just doing something physically fit as an older person, as a master's athlete, is going to be better than 99% of the population. And if you're a really competitive person, think about it this way. Frame it in this way, that you don't want to blow yourself up and not be able to compete and not be able to fulfill this plan, this grandiose plan that you have. So the short to long system, if you will, take that, that terminology, is one that you probably should adopt with all of your training. Now, off-season conditioning. Off-season conditioning should be something that still looks like the sport for you. You don't have time to go off into the wilderness and start doing all this crazy training that's very different and, and kind of away from what you're trying to do. You want to focus on short bursts of quality effort, which means whatever you're doing should be somewhat specific to what you're going to do in competition. Because as a master's athlete, you don't have time 
you don't have the frequency of competition to have this big buildup and then to have this large competitive phase where you do all these meets. You want to be in a good physical fitness at all times. Now, what's kind of funny is when we talk about some of our athletes, especially our throwers and uh, some of our bigger athletes who are not as mobile, like we may not do a big warm up you know, and do all of these things that are very specific to throwing. Instead, one of the things that, you know, uh, I read a long time ago in East German textbook of track and field is they would have their throwers and, and their bigger athletes play a lot of basketball to warm up, play volleyball. So as long as you're physically active and you're doing some of those types of things, I think that those, those are great things. You know, like when I have an athlete come out of basketball for me, and I know this is a high school kid, but those kids are always in the best shape. Very rarely do I have a track kid unless they're there all the time, kicking butt, taking names and doing everything I'm asking them to do. Are they going to be as prepared as these kids who have been playing basketball or volleyball or doing something competitive that requires, you know, movement forward and backwards and side to side and up and down. And as we get older, those are things that we can do to kind of help us stay in shape when the winter months are there and it's a little bit colder and we can't do some of the things we want to do. But one of the things you can do all the time, all year round in the off season is you can practice on acceleration. You don't need a large area to do that. You can accelerate over a single hurdle or two hurdles. You can do some run throughs, you know, through, uh, through a long jump pit without jumping. You know, you can still do some low amplitude bounding, things that we've already discussed. So in the off season, either we're playing games and playing sports and doing things to help us stay mobile and loose and, and have the ability to move side to side, up and down and back and forth, or we're doing small, short bursts of things that are very specific to our sport that you know will help us later on. You can't have these big buildups to it. You want to be doing some of the things that your sport requires. And probably if you have been a track athlete in the past and now you're a master's track athlete, you know, it's that whole concept of you never forget how to ride a bike. You probably have some of the skill sets to where you don't have to worry about, oh, if I do this, I'm going to get banged up or I'm not. No, you probably still know how to throw the jab. You probably still know how to throw the shot. Should you throw those implements at their full weight? Absolutely not. You know, but can you do a turbo jab? Can you do a light shot? Yes, and you should. And those are types of things, too, as an older athlete. You don't need to go to the wall all the time. You know, old man strength, right? There are things that you've developed neurologically that have been there for a long time. And so you don't have to do that. You know, you don't have to do full approach triple jumps or long jumps. You can do short approaches. And that stuff is just as good for an athlete just because you have the rhythm. You've been there before. You know what you're doing. Now, the last question that I had in there here was about 400 hurdle training. And that kind of segues into what we're talking about. First of all, if you're a master's athlete, you're doing the 400 hurdles. God bless you. <laughs> because that's like one of the hardest events in track and field. So, you know, may God have mercy on your soul. But in real, in real talk, one of the things that you can do is, again, talk going back to short approach jumps, light, lighter implements, um, shorter bursts, less is more. With the 400 hurdles, you know, you don't have to, hurdle all the time. One of the things that we do with, with our athletes is we still want them to simulate the steps, but if we're afraid that they're going to fatigue and that they're going to not be as aggressive through, let's say 300 meters, because we're covering 300 meters of the 400 and we're going over hurdles, we'll remove hurdles, but I will put the hurdle in the lane next to where the hurdle marks are at. And we call that ghosting a hurdle. And what that allows our athletes to do is they still feel the rhythm. They still are cued by the hurdle being there. They still know kind of the height and, and amplitude of which the knee has to be in to cover the hurdle. And you can see that rhythm, but they're not at risk of injuring themselves. One of the other things that I feel like is always good to do, especially if you're a master's athlete, is cut, cut the distance of those hurdles back. You know, cut it back so that you feel comfortable that you can hit your rhythm, you can hit your steps or lower the hurdles. There's no reason that you can't have a mini hurdle there for the first, you know, a uh, couple times that you go through a training session. You know, the other thing that I would suggest too is anytime you're going to do some extended intervals with hurdles on the track, you don't do all the hurdles through every rep that you're doing. Cut those hurdles down. Do a third of them. Maybe you attack the first, you know, 150 of the race. Then you do the middle 150, and then you do the last 150. Now, why do we do 150? Because you're going to have some overlap there where the athlete is still going to see, 
different parts of that hurdle race. But at the same time, it'll be at different starting points around the track and the athlete can get comfortable going over those hurdles without having to go over a complete flight and still be able to run them. And that's just good hurdle training over the long hurdles anyway, but more so for the master's athlete. And one of the things I would say is if you're going to do something crazy and try to run the full flight for a time trial or whatever, I would always cut back and subtract the amount of hurdles as you go through the workout. That's the other thing that I would probably do on the day of a workout when it comes to intervals in general with training. I would make sure that your intervals, whatever intervals you're going to run after you do some of your acceleration and your drills and some of your bounding and your plyometrics, the longest interval needs to happen earlier because as a master's athlete, you're dealing with diminishing returns. Usually your first or second interval is probably going to be your most quality interval, most likely your second one. And then after that, you're going to have to start cutting that interval down. So if you've got some big plan, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some speed endurance runs of 150s or 250s or something crazy like that, great. You might do one or two of those, and then the rest of your intervals need to get smaller and smaller and smaller. That doesn't mean the effort level has to change. That doesn't mean your pace has to change. But just realize that you know, you're dealing with diminishing returns. You're dealing with lesser of an energy system, and it's really important for you to still be able to maintain that quality. And the best thing you can do to maintain that quality is by cutting those intervals back throughout the course of the workout. I know some people like to go longer and longer, maybe in a race model type situation for teaching, and I'm cool with that. But that's younger athletes. You're an older athlete. You kind of know how to do this stuff already. You kind of know how it feels. So if you're doing it for training and you're trying to get a lot of training done, you can start with the longer intervals and work to the smaller ones. So that's just a couple ideas. I don't want to go on too long. Um, I don't mind doing this week to week to week. So if you guys have other ideas or things you want to hear me talk about or you want me to have some follow-up answers to questions, guys, please put it in the comments below. Um, and I will do my best job to answer those questions. I might just come back on here and do another video chat as we move forward. But uh, those were the things I had to talk about today. Acceleration, stride length, off-season training, and then how to handle, may God bless you, the 400 hurdles as a uh, master's level athlete. And we can get deeper into those subjects as you have more specific questions as we move forward. Thanks for coming in and, and checking out the talk. Uh, I look forward to seeing your comments below. Have a good day, guys.